you realize that how difficult it is to move a uh, even like a 150 pound person with all their gear on that it, it easily exceeds 200 pounds it becomes extremely difficult we always think that it would never happen to us it can happen to anybody and it, and it devastates the department enchanted sky media media From the Federal Resources Studio, this is Code 3, the Firefighters Podcast, hosted by award-winning journalist Scott Orr. Code 3 features interviews with leading members of the fire service, discussing firefighting strategy, tactics, and other topics you need to know more about. Now, here's Scott. That's right, and I will not let Parkinson stop me. Thank you for joining me again here on Code 3. This is the show for and about firefighters. We're informing and entertaining members of the fire service, just like you, from coast to coast. The RIT team has an important role at a fire scene. I say this not to be Captain Obvious, but because it's easy to forget that when you go to multiple fires and never take action. It's even easier to forget when the IC tells you to throw a ladder because you're just standing there. How much do you train for RIT operations? How realistic is that training? Today's guest would like to see you do more, and he'd like to see you practice unusual scenarios. Keith Paget is the fire chief of the Beulah Fire District in Valley, Alabama. He retired as the chief fire marshal for the Fulton County Fire Rescue Department. A 35-year member of the fire service, Keith currently serves as fire and emergency medical services academic program director with Columbia Southern University. And Keith Paget joins me now. Welcome to Code 3. Hey, Scott. How are you today? I, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and talk a little bit about RIT Teen Operation. Well, that's great. We're glad to have you. So let's start back in history a bit. What did the Brett Tarver incident in Phoenix 19 years ago teach us about RIT teams? I think it really exposed uh, how difficult it can be to remove a fellow firefighter from the uh, a building. I had an opportunity to set in the several presentations from members of the uh, Phoenix Fire uh, Department uh, on that event, as well as uh, Chief Brandesini's uh, comments. And um, through the uh, through the uh, removal of Brett from the building, they realized that they were having a difficult time of actually finding him, uh, grabbing hold of him, or removing him from the building. Bruno told us that through the process they were they actually had to pull his gear off of him it extremely difficult process and I, I think that's vital today for people to understand that they need to practice this event and if it if it ever happens in their department so with that in mind do you feel that firefighters train on red assignments often enough to stay proficient i don't think so i, I think we do uh, we do small scenarios such as a denver drill and remove people from uh, one room, maybe moving them to a, uh, um, a window in a uh, fire ground training center, removing them out. You know, I, I wrote the article that, uh, that appeared in Fire Rescue One saying, you know, take time to start off in how to package a patient, how to use a drag, your drag device in your gear in the, in the um, convenient location of the bay and then move to in maybe an interior of the training center or maybe even the firehouse down a hallway or out of a bunk room or up and down stairs. And it's easily and quickly you realize that how difficult it is to move a uh, even like a 150-pound person with all their gear on that it, it easily exceeds 200 pounds. It becomes extremely difficult. Right. And, and in the case of Brett Tarver, for example, he was in a mess of structural elements and shelving. So he wasn't just out in the open where it would be easy to drag him. With that in mind, what other kinds of training should people be doing? As I mentioned, the drag rescue device that's in the back of just about every every new turnout gear, bunker gear that we purchased tonight, th today, become very familiar with that. And, and then the uh, maybe the axe or halogen that can be placed through that or webbing or, or uh, a small section of rope 
and, and utilize how to package. There are several different areas that, that you can package a firefighter to get them to move them out of the building. You know, just getting the uh, great visibility, uh, one individual maybe uh, just turned uh, uh, dress in their turnout gear and then and then show how to package that person and repeat it over and over. So it becomes second nature because, you know, as well as I, if you're inside a one story residential structure you know, uh, with zero visibility, trying to package someone and move them out of there is going to be extremely difficult. Now, have you been in the situation where you've seen an IC look over at a RIT team, think they're not really doing anything, and ask them to help out with the firefighting? I think that's uh, that's a really good question. That's easy because we can, we still consider them as a resource, and we're we always think that it would never happen to us. So we want to use that. Say if they wanted to ladder a building, that incident commander could reach over there and easily grab the RIT team and deploy them into another assignment or a backup line, or a, a search and rescue team. And it's, it's extremely difficult to just have one or two or, or, or more firefighters standing prepared to perform a rescue that hopefully will never happen. So it, it's, it's difficult to, to, to not be able to utilize that resource. Well, I've spoken to some folks who've said that asking them to do something simple like throwing a ladder is not really a problem, but I'm curious how you feel about that. And that's, and that's a good question because if you do allow them to, to leave their assigned location and begin to move around the, uh, the fire ground, you know as well as I, the difficulty of, of retrieving them back to that location, whether it's a command post or a, uh, a place that they're, that they're staged, communication is vital. If you did that, I think if they went to throw a ladder against the, let's just say the the B or D side of the structure, you know, you would have to have them go take care of that task and immediately, re- uh, re- you know, report back to the command post and, and let the incident commander know that they're available for another assignment. But of course, as soon as you start asking them to do one task, another one comes up that they seem to be available for. And my question is, aren't, aren't we putting firefighters at risk if we use these guys when they really ought to be standing ready at all times? I, I believe so. I, I concur with you. I, I think they should be dedicated. Uh, if you're going to form a RIT team, uh, they, they should be prepared, trained, and, uh, and ready to be available uh, to respond if there's a need. I've had the opportunity of, of, uh, of, of serving on a RIT team as well as having work under me as an as a incident commander. And, and sometimes it's difficult for those members to, to serve in that position because they, they want to be actively involved in the extinguishment or, or a search and, search and rescue team, So and, and they feel like they're not being utilized. So it, it has to be a buy-in from, from all members of the organization, of the department, to realize how vitally important the uh, RIT team is and, and the role it plays on the fire ground. I'll be back with more right after this. Federal Resources is a mission-critical solutions provider with only one goal, to empower and prepare the first responder for any threat, at home or abroad, that they are called on to respond to. Your mission is to protect and defend. Our mission is to make sure you're equipped with the knowledge and training on response techniques to current threats. We'll make sure you know the latest innovations in technology to ensure mission success every time. You look out for everyone else. Let us look out for you. Learn more at federalresources.com. Let's switch tracks for a moment here. Why do firefighters seem to be reluctant to call a mayday until it's the very last possible moment? Uh, Scott, that's, that's something that we kind of almost joke about in my department now because a firefighter doesn't want to be recognized as the person that that had to be rescued. They want to be the person that rescues someone. So uh, as I as I tell my members, I said, you know, if you get turned around, if you get lost, if you get door- disoriented, don't hesitate to key up the radio. And 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 you don't have to call a big mayday mayday over the radio. Just call the incident commander and say, hey, look, I, I'm on the second floor. I'm disoriented. Uh, I, I need. I might need some help. And um and then and then we'll send somebody. But if you feel like that you that you're totally lost, you cannot find your way out of the building, you can't determine where you're at. Don't hesitate, uh, because there's there's always that danger that you could easily 
expire inside a residential structure as well as a large warehouse. So don't hesitate to call. Speaking of buy-in, you need to have buy-in from everybody that doing that when you're not actually trapped or injured is not going to be seen as a sign of weakness. That the IC isn't going to say, don't let that happen again. That's right. That's right. You know, and, and, and like I said, the buy-in comes from the members of the organization. If All of them have been at some point in their career inside, even if it was in training, they get disoriented and they're a little embarrassed. We got to, we got to throw it out there. A little, little embarrassed to say that, that they got lost inside the building. If they get lost a couple of times and have to call a May Day, there might be some training involved to kind of fix that or address that issue. But if they're, if they're turned around, they shouldn't be hesitant at all to reach out just to say on the radio, you know, practice there. If it's, if it's lunar or something else, just to make sure that they're, uh, you know, they realize that, that they're in danger and they shouldn't be uh, embarrassed or scared to let somebody go. Turning back to the red team now, what kinds of problems do red teams face if a firefighter falls down through a floor? You know, the, years ago, I was a, uh, a division chief and I was a safety chief that went to different uh, alarms in our uh, uh, in our department. And I showed up one night. The humidity that evening was extremely thick, heavy, high percentage. So the um, the smoke was right on the ground and it was difficult to even see around the structure. Uh, I, I showed up, made a 360 of the of the once it was a one story residential. Uh, came back to the front of the building and there was an attack line going, uh, make an attempt to uh, go in the front door. And when I got back around to the front, I, I let them know that there was a significant amount of fire in the basement. Uh, and I said, you know, I, I would, I would not advance that line in the front door. And within moments that floor collapsed and they were not inside. So I, but however, if they had been, there's opportunities to uh, either utilize the hose line to protect them or even uh, allow them to uh, to grab hold of a hose line that's been looped around to pull them back out of the uh, out of the, the lower elevation of the floor. Right, but I think you're looking at a nightmare situation if somebody drops through a floor and is knocked unconscious because they can't help themselves at all at that point. Absolutely. I think that's an opportunity for us to, to practice again if you have access to maybe a, a, an acquired structure to go to the second floor, uh, uh, open up a hole and practice of lowering a ladder, a short ladder or, or a roof ladder down into that that opening and, and simulating that basement rescue. Uh, because as, as you as you know, uh, someone falling down in there would be that nightmare and you would have to have to get them out as quick as possible because there was there would be a large amount of volume of fire in, in the basement or in that first or second floor. So they, they need to be pulled out of there as quick as possible. Considering all the things that can go wrong, why do you suppose it is that most departments don't place a high priority on red training? I think it's kind of think it goes back to they believe it just won't happen to us. They feel confident in, in their ability to operate on the fire ground, and then they read about it on major news scenes or, or, or some of the email feeds, but they, they truly just don't believe it will happen to us. And I, I know that it can happen. It happened in my old apartment in Fulton County. We lost a member in a um, uh, two-story with a full basement on Memorial Day in, uh, in the late 2000s. So it can happen to anybody, and it, and it devastates the department. You know, I think that there's something to be said about the attitude that people get when they watch some of these YouTube videos. Oh, man, he screwed up. We'd never make that mistake. That's that's true. That's true. Because again, like like I said, people think that they're above that. It's easy to make a mistake if you don't train and train all the time. That can happen, and and even it, it happens to the best of us. So uh, I I encourage uh, I encourage everyone to to practice with RIT team, deploying RIT team, good communication skills, uh, understanding fire behavior, building construction reading smoke. There's a lot that comes into play. So it needs to be repetitive training every week if possible. If it's, if it's a career department, it should be every shift. If it's a volunteer or a combination department, have at least one training night a week that you cover some of these issues. 
All right, Keith Padgett, thanks for talking with me today on Code 3. Scott, I can't thank you enough. If I can, if I can be any of assistance, you know, please reach out to me, and, and I'll, uh, I'll be glad to come back and talk at any time. And we put some more information about what RIT teams should know on our website, code3podcast.com slash rescue team. Check it out. Now, time for trivia. What temperature rating does a glass bulb sprinkler with a blue bulb have? I'll have the answer right after this. If you like Code 3, you'll love the Code 3 Bull Session. It's more discussion with our guests on any topic. Sometimes it's serious. Sometimes it's not so serious. But it's only available to patrons of Code 3. Find out what you've been missing. Go to Code3Podcast.com slash support. Pledge just $10 a month to support Code 3, and you'll get immediate access to all the Bull Sessions in our library and future interviews as we post them. Become a patron today, support the show, and get access to the Code 3 Bull Sessions. Now here's the trivia answer. In glass bulb sprinklers, a blue bulb means it has a temperature rating of 250 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, that's it. That's all for this edition of Code 3. Love to hear what you think of the show. Just email me, scott at code3podcast.com. Thank you for listening. I'll be back next time with more. I hope you'll join me. I'm Scott Orr, and until then, stay safe. Code 3 is made possible through the generous support of Federal Resources. Visit them at federalresources.com. This show is a production of Enchanted Sky Media. To contact us, get more information on today's show, or to subscribe to the podcast, go to Code3Podcast.com.